Hey guys, today I want to talk about twisting the meaning of certain words for political purposes. If you haven't guessed from previous videos, the prevailing method from these alt-right figures is deceit. And it's no different with today's topic, which is a certain word. A word that the alt-right or other far-right figures just love to use. Uh, revisionism. Holocaust revisionists. Which revisionists like myself do. Holocaust revisionist organization. Revisionists. Holocaust revisionists. Now, what does revisionism mean? And why would the alt-right have an interest in using it? It sounds very scientific and gives the person using it the look of someone who knows what they're talking about. The context to hear this word in, at least from the far right, is usually the Holocaust, as in Holocaust revisionism. Now, is Holocaust revisionism necessarily a bad thing? Quite the contrary, actually. But let's look at the definition first. According to the Cambridge Dictionary, revisionism is asking questions about and trying to change existing beliefs about how events happened or what their importance or meaning is. The revisionism that the dictionary is talking about is an approach to historical research, and all legitimate historians engage in revisionism in some way. You see, historians are not just the record keepers of history whose job is to write down whatever happened at a certain period in time. Their job is also to interpret the past and to help us gain a better understanding of the present. In that sense, revisionism is the most exciting part of history. The goal is to challenge orthodox interpretations by examining new and already existing evidence to reach a historical consensus closer to the truth. Revisionist historians ask new questions and seek to reach new conclusions. This is an insanely important tool for society to properly understand its history. Similar to when a chemist reruns a previous experiment to affirm its validity. When revisionism is done correctly, it can help us see the past in a different light. An example of this would be the popular cliché that the World War II buffs of you will be very familiar with. Namely that Nazi Germany only lost against the Soviet Union because the Soviets had a seemingly endless supply of disposable soldiers. Of course the German tactics and equipment was way superior than what the Soviets could deliver, but what can you do when you are hopelessly outnumbered? This was the prevailing narrative for quite some time after World War II and stemmed from the fact that Western historians heavily relied on the accounts of German generals when learning about the war in the East. It took some time for this to be overturned and historians got access to material that showed that some of the best generals in World War II came from the Soviet Union. So as you can see, not accepting the past that it is already written can be very beneficial. To gain new insight in a historical field, a historian has to engage with the work of previous historians and either build on that or discard it and explain his reasoning for that or what he believes to be correct. Now, what has this to do with the alt-right? Well... They know that revisionism is a genuine historical practice, so they try to hijack the term to make their version of history seem just as legitimate as what real historians offer. What drives the natives through their usage of the word, though, is that all revisionism is based on certain undisputable facts. And this might become clearer when I give you an example. I think it's safe to say that a big motivator for the appeasement policy towards Hitler prior to World War II was the carnage caused by World War I. France and Britain were still recovering from the previous conflict that churned up millions of their citizens and a large part of their wealth. This among other factors is why they were so lenient towards Hitler instead of turning down his demands and threatening him with force. Now what revisionism in this context might look like is if a historian would go back to examine the evidence for this claim and together with some new evidence come to the conclusion that the reason for Britain's and France's tame attitude is a different one. For instance that they felt bad for the measures imposed on Germany after World War I and wanted to make up for that. Then this claim would be reviewed by other historians and so on until a new conclusion is reached or the previous one is affirmed. What a revisionist historian would not do is claim that World War I actually did not happen and disregard all evidence for its existence. Someone like this might come out and claim World War I is in reality just a conspiracy by Britain and France to excuse their bad policy towards Hitler. And of course, Germany is also in on it because they would have an excuse to explain the rise of fascism in their country. Now, I'm not saying a lot of people didn't die during 1914 and 1918, but those were actually just caused by the Spanish flu. It says right here on the Wikipedia page that the flu killed about 50 to 100 million people. And all those trenches, of course, did also exist, but those were dug by soldiers to combat the huge flood that occurred in 1916. In this picture you can see how civilians and soldiers set up sandbags against the flood and if you pay close attention to how their surrounding looks, it seems very similar to what those conspirators claim the, air quotes, battlefields of World War I look like. But in reality, of course, this damage was all caused by water. Now naturally all of this is a bunch of nonsense, but this is exactly the way Holocaust deniers construct their narrative. 
They use the term revisionism for this to keep up the facade of a group whose only objective is to pursue the truth. Simultaneously, the goal is to undermine the audience's trust in orthodox historians and ultimately to buy into the narrative of a Jewish conspiracy. The alt-right, when using the term revisionism, is not engaging in historical research. For them, it's an ideological exercise. Even the definition shows how their usage of the word is misleading, if you recall. Asking questions about and trying to change existing beliefs about how events happened or what their importance or meaning is. Not claiming those events didn't happen if they did happen. They have no other choice to deny the Holocaust because if they would really reinterpret the meaning of the Holocaust, they would expose themselves as Nazi apologists. And this also extends to the claim I often get under my videos about Holocaust denial. Holocaust deniers view the term denier as a derogatory term that is supposed to shut down the conversation. And the hostility they get when spouting their nonsense affirms their views in a lot of cases. For them it's a where is smoke there is fire kind of thing. The truth doesn't fear investigation, so if the Holocaust happened, why can't you question it? Well, you absolutely can. You can have all kinds of different opinions on the Holocaust. For instance, under Holocaust scholars there's still a big debate going on between intentionalists who believe the Nazis intended to murder all Jews in their field of influence right from the start, and functionalists who believe there wasn't a real blueprint for the Holocaust, but the Nazis did it because they maneuvered themselves into a blind alley. And neither of these two groups is penalized for their views, because they don't act like irrational ideologues who deny every shred of evidence that goes against their narrative. That is why I never use the term revisionist when talking about people who are clearly deniers, in the sense that they deny historical reality agreed upon by research. If you deny X, you shouldn't be surprised if the people surrounding you call you an X denier. Even the most famous denier of them all, David Irving, said, I'm a gas chamber denier. I'm a denier that they killed hundreds of thousands of people in gas chambers, yes. To stay in our previous analogy, this would be similar to a person claiming there was no artillery in World War I or something like that. When making such unfounded claims with no regards for evidence, you're putting yourself outside the academic field of historical revisionism and you can't be surprised if people don't want to engage with you about your wild fantasies that stem from bigotry. So when someone goes the extra mile to point out they're a revisionist, proceed with caution. Legitimate historians usually don't use the word to describe themselves anymore because of the negative connotation it got from fascist crackpots. This advice goes for all kind of revisionism, by the way. Although this video is about why the alt-right uses the term, there are all kinds of, air quotes, revisionists. There are self-described revisionists who believe the Chinese discovered America, or that the city of Atlantis is real, or that the man-made famine which killed several million Ukrainians in the early 1930s is a hoax or wasn't caused or significantly worsened by Soviet policy at the time. Sadly, history tends to get heavily politicized, so this is just something we have to live with. Thanks for watching everyone. I apologize if this one was a bit dry for your taste, but I'm still trying to get a feel of you as an audience, so don't shy away from leaving a comment about what you like to see or don't like to see. Besides that, I should have mentioned this earlier, but when you try to gain historical knowledge, which you really shouldn't from YouTube by the way, always make sure you know who you are listening to. And this absolutely includes me. I'm currently reading a book in which the historian when citing other people always explains how they align politically. Watch out for this sort of stuff. Besides that, although my focus in regards to Holocaust denial currently lies on the alt-right, this stuff is also found in other extremist circles. For instance, it is also very common for Islamists, and I probably would make a video about this in some time, but we'll see. Also, I'm currently thinking about setting up a Patreon account for this channel. Now before your eyes slide down to the current subscriber count and you start laughing, hear me out. I'm fully aware of the fact that at this stage, I might get about $3 a month if I'm lucky that is. It's not just that though. Doing what I do on this channel, I don't want to be reliant on YouTube for one second, really. I fully expect to get mass flagged and demonetized once this channel grows a bit and is considered for monetization in the first place. Case in point would be a YouTuber called Miles Power, who debunks all kinds of stuff on his channel. Recently he announced to debunk the most popular arguments of Holocaust deniers and has now stopped after his second video on the subject. Not only is the topic really depressing for him and deniers won't change their minds anyway, but his first video that he ever did on the subject got flagged for hate speech. So it would be great to worry about that stuff a bit less when deciding on future topics. Besides that it would be a cool opportunity to engage with you guys a bit more in doing live streams or Patreon only content or other rewards. I'm still a bit of a newcomer to all of this, so feel free to tell me what you think. Now if you stayed around to hear me ramble on, I once again thank you for watching and if you like, subscribe and follow me on Twitter. Until next time, have a good one.